thought for that introduction and hello everyone. Um, uh, like Paul said, my expertise is uh, really in instrumentation and optics and um, I'm relatively new to solar physics. Um, so a lot of my focus in this talk is going to be on the instrument and technology side of things. Um, I will do my best to give a little bit of a scientific maybe background or context for each of our missions. But um, like I said, I will be focusing a little bit more on the technology side of things. Um, but maybe just to kind of preface this whole talk, um, for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with sounding rocket missions, um, I'd like to maybe kind of briefly describe the uh, philosophy of sounding rockets is really kind of this very experimental space. It's very uh, proof of concept. So a lot of these uh, instruments, we, we basically mount them to these kind of small um, rocket vehicles. For example, here's the high C sounding rocket that was launched in 2018 um, from White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Um, these sounding rockets, they have short suborbital flights. We are above the atmosphere um, for about five-ish minutes. Um, so we, we generate a relatively small amount of data in that time. Um, these missions are uh, relatively uh, short, they're very fast paced. Uh, project life cycle is about three years and we do a launch about every year. So we often have a lot of overlapping missions ongoing at the same time. Um, for which we share a lot of the same resources and personnel. So all of us here at Marshall are really busy working on multiple different projects at the same time, um, one right after the other. So it's very exciting and engaging, fast-paced work. Um, and even though we, we don't generate a lot of data, you know, we, we're about five minutes of observation time, um, the kind of data that we generate is usually very scientifically valuable because it's often the first of its kind. Um, demonstrating a new technology or a new instrument or a new measurement entirely to help elucidate some other uh, mystery of the sun. Um, so, of course, a lot of our, our missions, the main goal is to develop technologies that can later be adapted to larger satellite or space-based missions. Um, but we often do have a lot of really interesting scientific results from these short missions, too. So, um, to kind of organize my talk, I wanted to just give a little bit of a timeline of some of the recent missions that I'm going to be talking about. Um, first, I'll talk about high c and CLASP, which were launched in 2018 and 2019, respectively. Um, and I'll go over some of the first and preliminary results from those two missions. Um, and then um, I'll kind of shift and, and move towards a status update on some of our upcoming missions, including um, MAGICS, which we hope to launch summer of this year. Uh, hopefully we'll launch first the year after that, and then uh, in, a, in 2024, we're going to be launching um, the very exciting HICE Flare campaign. So it's kind of an overview of how this talk is organized. Um, of course, um, as all of you I'm sure are aware, we were surprised by the COVID-19 pandemic, and that pushed a lot of our ongoing work back because we weren't able to go into the lab to prepare everything. So we've already slipped on some of these launch dates and we're, we're, we have plans for new launch dates, but hopefully we're going to be maintaining um, kind of our, our ongoing schedule. So to start off with, I'll just, um, I'll start up this talk by talking about high c 2.1, which is the high resolution coronal imager. Um, this is a collaboration between the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, this is the second successful launch of this instrument. The first instrument was launched in 2012. Um, since then, we recoded some of the optics and uh, launched it again, uh, May 2018 from White Sands Missile Range. Um, I just wanted to share with you some of the, the some photographs from some of our pre-launch operations, just because, uh, just to help give a visual for what it's like working on some of these sounding rocket payloads. Um, so here, here we are um, in the clean room facilities doing some alignment work uh, with high c We have, um, uh, so about a month before launch, we all go out to White Sands Missile Range and we spend the entire month there integrating the payload with the vehicle and the avionics, uh, performing a slew of tests to make sure that the instrument will withstand launch. Um, Here's some of us working on some alignment of the instrument with the various sensors that are used to perform pointing of the whole vehicle. 
Um, and then after launch, of course, the, the instrument lands somewhere in the New Mexico desert and the, some of our team has to go out on a helicopter and retrieve the payload. So this is um, some of the high sea team going out to, into the desert to find the high sea payload um, for its uh, most recent launch. So high C, the goal of high C is really to image the solar corona with sub arc second resolution. Um, and we do that with this, um, this beautiful instrument, which consists of a normal incidence uh, UV telescope, uh, primary mirror, secondary mirror that focuses everything onto a um, Marshall built low noise camera. Uh, we have an H alpha camera that's co-aligned to this instrument, which helps us point the instrument to the active region that we want to visualize during flight. Um, this was designed with a plate scale of about one tenth of a arc second per pixel. Uh, we're imaging the 172 pass band at a cadence of 4.4 seconds. So this is going to give us some really beautiful and uh, fairly, fairly dynamic images of the sun. Um, here is the full data set during flight. Uh, from high C 2.1. You can, you can find the rest of the details from this mission in our 2019 paper. Oops. Um, I'll just play that again. Uh, here's the AIA full disk image just for context. And here's the field of view um, that high C image during that flight. Um, so you can see we really did get some very beautiful images of this beautiful active region during flight. Um, we got some loop structure. We got a lot of fine scale moss structure. Uh, we were able to see a lot of interesting brightenings in this region over here. Um, but uh, one thing that we did observe, um, you can probably tell that the image is going kind of in and out of focus. Um, and, and that's not just your eyes, that's really happening um, due to a malfunction of one of the gyros that's responsible for stabilizing the role of the instrument. Um, every eight frames or so, we got a very bl motion blurred image. Um, so for example, here you can see one of the very sharpest images that we achieved and right next to it, we have one of the, a very blurry image of the same kind of uh, region. Uh, for comparison with AIA, basically our blurred images are not any better than AIA can achieve. However, we did ultimately in our sharp images, we did obtain our, achieve our goal. Um, we got sub arc second resolution, probably about 0.3, 0.4 arc seconds uh, is our achieved resolution. It's just shy of our um, theoretical Nyquist limit that the instrument was designed to do. Of course, it was a little bit challenging to actually characterize before flight the actual performance of um, uh, the resolution performance of high C. But from analyzing just the image data itself uh, via you know looking at find features or doing a Fourier analysis to determine the spatial frequency content represented in each frame, we're able to kind of approximate what that resolution performance was. Um, one of our ongoing pieces of study for high c um, we're trying to recapture that full data set so we can really get that whole 4.4 uh, second cadence that the instrument was initially designed for. So we can really study some of the fine tune or the fine scale dynamics. Um, so we're trying to recover some of those blurry frames. We do actually measure jitter during flight. So um, kind of using a combined uh, knowledge of that jitter data and a Fourier analysis to estimate the point spread function, we're able to take some of the moderately blurred images and regain some high resolution content from that. Um, of course, this is an ongoing effort. We haven't achieved a lot of success for very motion blurred images, for example, um, these point spread functions that are estimated with Fourier analysis, the ones in which it looks like multiple Gaussians on top of each other are not very well um, re re reconstructed. So that's still an ongoing effort. Um, but hopefully once we get this data set in shape, we'll actually recover the full high resolution, high speed data so that we can study some of these fine scale structures in more detail. Um, from there, I'll move on to the CLASP-2 instrument, which was launched in April of 2019. This is the Chromospheric Layer Spectropolarimeter. Um, this, again, was a reflight of uh, a modified CLASP-1, which was originally launched in 2015. This is a collaboration between the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and Marshall uh, Space Flight Center. Here you can see some of our JSI collaborators and our engineering team just getting it done during um, the month that we spend at White Sands before launch. 
Um, here's a, a good picture of one of the more scary tests that we do on these payloads. Um, this is the whole payload integrated together. Um, so this is not the vehicle, just the instrument itself. And it's mounted on top of a shaker table so that we can perform a vibe test um, to make sure that it's going to withstand the, um, the loads of launch. So before launch, we do a test and we vibe it. And we do a test right after launch just to make sure nothing moved and that everything is still, in fact, working. Um, so that's kind of just an example of some of the, the fun work that we do out at White Sands. The goal of CLASP is to, um, or of CLASP 2, I should say, is to measure the full Stokes parameters of the magnesium H and K lines, from which we can infer some really interesting um, features of the chromospheric magnetic field. We do that with this instrument here. Uh, we have a Cassegrain telescope uh, that focuses light onto a slit, which is then imaged by a slit shot imaging system. Um, the light passes through a ro rotating wave plate and is then separated into orthogonal axes of the polarized light um, uh, to by the, the grating itself and then analyzed here under the cameras. Um, and with this instrument, we were able to um, measure the full Stokes parameters of the magnesium H and K lines. Um, we were fortunate enough during this very short flight to have enough signal and time to actually do two different pointings so we put our slit on a plage region of the sun as well as some quiet sun just over the limb um, to also measure the kind of uh, center to limb variation of this signal. Um, and we, we did successfully measure the full Stokes parameters, um, particularly of interest, we measured the Stokes V, or the circular polarization of this magnesium H and K lines, which um, gives us some really interesting inferences about the longitudinal magnetic field if you are interested in um, the full details on that result, you only have to wait till this Friday and uh, Dr. Ishikawa's paper is going to be published this Friday in Science Advances, so you can look forward to that. Um, next, I'll move on to some of our upcoming work. Um, this is the MAGIX, or the Marshall Grazing Incident X-ray Spectrometer. Uh, our goal here in MAGIX is to measure the, some high temperature but low emission measure plasma um, that can kind of be seen in this blind spot here. So we have several different instruments available to us, uh, for example, ICE and XRT, that give us x space spectra, but um, none of it is quite sensitive enough to measure this plasma that's high temperature and kind of low emission measure. Ultimately, what we're looking for is a diagnostic that can help us determine the frequency of coronal heating events. Um, this will help us discriminate between competing theories of coronal heating, either you know, impulsive nano flare mechanisms or steady state wave heating mechanisms, um, just depending on the quantity of you know, the signal that we measure in this kind of blind spot region here. Um, so we've designed MAGIX to do this for us. MAGIX consists of a Walter One a uh, grazing incidence telescope. Um, so you have this grazing incidence optic here, which focuses the light onto a slit um, and then passes through a pair of imaging spectrograph mirrors, uh, which is then the light is then focused onto a grating, which diffracts and focuses everything onto this low noise camera. Um, a lot of the work that I focused on for MAGIX, uh, besides from aligning and characterizing this entire instrument is um, designing this slit jaw assembly, which is presents a, a fairly, um, I guess, interesting set of challenges. Imaging in the X-ray can be a little bit challenging due to all of the, you know, required grazing incidence optics. But what we've decided to do here for Magix is we allow a little bit of UV light to pass along into the instrument, along with the X-ray light that we're actually trying to visualize with the spectrometer. Um, our slit is coated with a fluorescent coating. And that UV light is absorbed and re-emitted in the visible. So we're able to image the sun um, in with, with actually a fairly inexpensive set of visible uh, commercial off-the-shelf low-light camera and lens assembly, which is kind of imaged here. Um, and then we have a very uh, simple implementation of a Python GUI to do that real-time um, pointing analysis to help us point our slit onto a nice active region during flight. 
So right before uh, the pandemic hit, we were just finishing up a lot of our characterization of magics. We were at the uh, X-ray cryogenic facility at Marshall, which uh, is the same facility that a lot of James Webb testing and uh, Chandra testing was performed at. Um, so we were able to do a lot of our throughput characterizations and spectral calibration at that facility. Um, and, and then the pandemic hit and then we weren't able to go into the lab anymore. So our launch slipped. But now we're just starting to get back to the lab and we have just the finishing touches of integration and testing um, right before we can ship the whole thing to White Sands. And we're still hoping to launch in August of this year. Um, so cross your fingers and look forward to that. Um, next, I'll talk about FIRST, which is the Full Sun UV Rocket Spectrometer. This is actually a Montana State University-led mission. Uh, Marshall is contributing mainly the camera and the calibration systems for this um, sounding rocket. Um, but this is a really interesting, I think, an interesting payload. Um, it basically will enable the first high quality UV spectra of the sun as a star. So what we're really looking for with uh, FIRST is to study the sun in kind of its stellar context, um, generating um, spectra that's really analogous to some to the spectra that's generated by some of the Hubble Space Telescope um, instruments. Um, and, and, you know, we can't really do this right now with the way that we typically create uh, solar spectrum. Um, typically, solar spectrum, we use a, a slit spectrometer, and, we, and if we wanted the full disk of the sun, we would scan that slit over the entire sun um, and generate our UV spectra. Um, that kind of data takes hours, sometimes days, to generate. Um, but what we would really like to do is capture the full sun at one instance in time and continue to measure that over time to really get that stellar context of our sun. Um, of course, for that, gen that has a lot of interesting challenges, but um, the way that FIRST proposes to do this kind of uh, imaging or this kind of spectrometry, spectrometry um, is to use, uh, basically replace an entrance slit of a typical spectrometer and replace that with a cylindrical feed optic. So um, at this point, we're, we'll have this cylindrical feed optic, which will collect light from the entire solar disk and focus it onto a single 1D line. And that's kind of our new slit. Um, uh, each of those feed optics will have about seven of them placed at different positions along the Roland circle relative to this uh, diffraction grating. Um, and then we'll sequentially uh, shutter, open, and close these different feed optics so that we can get different access or access to different parts of the spectrum uh, from about 120 to 180 nanometers. And this will provide us with relatively high um, spectral resolution of uh, UV spectral or UV. Uh, uh, spectra. So the one of the big challenges, though, with creating this Hubble analog data is the calibration that's required to do this. So Hubble has the great advantage of being able to point to uh, a well-known stellar reference to actually do some in situ calibration. Of course, for a short five-minute solar sounding rocket launch, we can't point to a white dwarf and characterize our system that way. Um, so what we have to do instead is we have to build up this entire, entirely new portable vacuum ultraviolet calibration system, which we'll be able to use at all of the various locations that we're going to be building this instrument. So we'll be able to use it at Marshall and at uh, Montana State University, as well as um, um, White Sands Missile Range right before and after launch. Um, and we really, in order to, to calibrate this instrument to the level that we need to in order to generate Hubble analog spectra, um, it's pretty ambitious. We have to really think about absolutely everything that could impact the signal um, or the wavelength um, in the, the path of light so that we can ultimately trace it back to a um, reference source. So that's an ongoing effort and um, we're, we're, we're making a lot of new progress on that. Um, here is the, our preliminary design of our calibration system. And hopefully this will be, um, I guess, a really robust system that we'll be able to use for a lot of our other future missions. Um, because we do do a lot of work in the EUV and X-ray, and so we hope to be able to use this system to calibrate some of our future missions. So um, with, with that said, maybe I'll, I'll start wrapping up some of this talk a little bit uh, by talking about the high C flare uh, campaign which is a really exciting um, 
and, and new mission for us at Marshall. Um, so we do a lot of sounding rockets that are one instrument at a time. Um, and we, we, we have a launch date in mind and we, we hope that we might have a, a, a target at that time. So sometimes the sun doesn't cooperate and we don't have an active region or uh, whatever it is that we're trying to look for. And we have to postpone launch and we come back and we launch again. But for high sea flare, we're actually trying to uh, launch during an active flare. And that's gonna, that's gonna require us to kind of stay out there much longer and just be ready for whenever a flare happens to occur. Um, this is a really interesting payload. What we're really interested in trying to do is answer some questions about uh, the mechanics that drive late, late phase flare heating, uh, how energy is transferred downward from the corona to the chromosphere in some flares, and also um, kind of the dynamics of some uh, energetic particles, how they're generated and how they propagate into the heliosphere. So we're going to be doing that with this suite of instruments. Um, we'll, we'll basically take uh, a version of high C, which will give us that high resolution coronal image. Um, and we're gonna couple that with a slitless imaging spectrometer um, called Kool-Aid. So this will give us a full imaging spectrum and we'll have two orthogonal arms of this so that we can actually disentangle that data and invert it to, to get our uh, well-resolved spectra. Um, and then along with that, we're going to have an instrument that is uh, a full sun uh, X-ray detector. We're also going to launch this simultaneously with uh, the Foxy sounding rocket, which is, which is another X-ray imaging um, instrument. So with this full suite of instruments, we, we're in a really unique position to study flare dynamics um, at, a, at a level that's really kind of never been done before. So um, we're really interested to get this, this all Kind of assembled together. This is a really big collaboration between SAO and Marshall Space Flight Center, Montana State University, um, and hopefully we'll get all of the particulars that uh, come with this multiple instrument payload worked out by March 2024. Um, so that's about everything I had planned today. I kind of went through that a lot faster than I had planned to, but um, I think at this point I can open up to any questions and we can just discuss anything that came up. Um, if there are any questions. Sorry, I was talking there and I was muted. Um, yes, yeah. so if, if anyone has um, questions, feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask something about the CLASP2 slide that you showed. Sure, so, yeah. Um, it looked like to me on there that the um, the K line uh, you like make and, and the in the intensity H and K both look pretty strong, right? But yeah. your your polarization signals will kind of look nice for the K line, but not so much for H. And I wonder, is there an instrumental thing going on there, or is this kind of really? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I would. First of all, state that I, I don't know a lot of the details of analyzing this data. Um, and further, I'm also not really allowed to talk too much about this data because it's not it's been embargoed and I'm not really supposed to talk about it until it's been published. Um, but maybe I will say very briefly, I, I don't think there was anything unexpected about this data. It performed uh, almost exactly how we thought it would perform. Um, so those, those intensities or the strength of those lines are, I think, pretty close to what was predicted uh, by the theories. Um, but you can, more details are definitely in, in this uh, paper that it's going to drop on Friday, so you can go there to get a little bit more details. Um, Jen, I can just add that, yeah, the H line in linear polarization in the Hunley effect is inherently unpolarizable. So we weren't expecting to see linear polarization in that line. Oh, Thank I you, Laurel. I didn't know that you were on this talk. Um, hi, Jen. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, Laurel was intimately involved in all of these projects, too, so um, I'm really happy to hear her voice. Hey, so Phil Chamberlain had a question. Um, do you want to ask it yourself, Phil, or should I just read it out? Yeah, I guess I can. Uh, so I was just wondering what the time cadence of high C flare is. Um, ooh, that's a good question. 
I'm pretty sure that we're trying to keep it pretty close to what Chi C 2.1 performed. Uh, no, that's not true. I think we're trying to go faster. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, though. Um, ultimately, we are trying to study flare dynamics, so it, it has to be relatively quick. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I can get back to you on that if you if you send me an email. OK, thank you. And this, this mission is also going to wait for a flare to happen before you launch. Is that right? Yeah, so it's a little bit complicated. Um, we're, we're actively working on good ways to do some earlier or shorter duration flare prediction. But kind of the, the working theory is that we will go out to Alaska, where we're going to be launching this from, um, integrate all of the payloads, integrate onto the vehicle, get everything ready. It's going to be sitting on the rail, ready to launch. Uh, we'll have about a two-week window uh, where the instrument is ready to launch. And hopefully, we'll have a flare in that two-week window um, and um, launch as, as quickly as we can from when we get our first warning of when that flare is happening. But yeah, the, the goal is to launch as close to a flare as possible. And what's, so once you detect a flare or, yeah, OK, once you get detect a flare and decide you'll launch, how long from that point until you actually get observations? Um, from when we actually get observations, from when we we'll launch, you mean, or from the detection of a flare? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I guess, I'm trying to get as like how long of a, of a delay is there from when you decide you will? Yeah. Launch so from so from when we launch to um, you know getting access to the data, I guess it's the turnaround is a, about a day because uh, well, you know, we actually. Oh, so you know, yeah. So I wasn't really asking about access to the data. I just meant. Okay. When you actually start observing. Oh, okay. Um, well, from our launch, it, it only takes a, a couple of minutes to get above the atmosphere on these launches. So um, maybe 60 seconds from launch time. Okay. So I so, saw uh, Phil Judge has his hand up earlier, but you put it down again. Are you, you still want to ask something, Phil? Uh, sure. I was... Uh, <clears throat> Um, usurped in my question by Laurel who answered it. Yeah, the J equals a half, the J equals a half transitions aren't, aren't polarizable at least. Uh, and unless you have some small component of, of a, an isotope which gives it some, uh, a spin of uh, uh, one from the nucleus interaction, nuclear interaction, you're not gonna see polarization. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is, these are beautiful data. I'm, we're really excited here to, um, to see the results from this class two uh, uh, experiment uh, for, for, for reasons which I can't go into at the moment, but which will become evident at some point. Uh, and you know, what, what I like there is I see a lot of uh, signal in, uh, in a few weak lines uh, um, yeah. in as well. Uh, That's true. There were more lines than just the magnesium H and K line that um, yeah, are already yeah. printed on this. Mm -hmm. So that Absolutely. looks like a real success to me, that one. I mean, uh, that's that's really impressive what you've done there. Um, I did have a question about the flare mission, and that was, um, how, how do you avoid overexposing when you're in the X-ray uh, region? Yeah, that's, that's a very, um, I guess, active part of what we're trying to do sort out with our radiometry. Um, mm. We have a target like type of flare that we um, want to analyze. So we're looking at pretty strong flares. Um, and we, you know, our target, our required target has to, I think, I can't remember exactly what the class, it might be X class flare. Um, but we, we actually, um, we're changing our cameras so instead of, we typically, for high C flare, for example, we use some really sensitive um, UV cameras. Um, but for high C flare, we're going to be changing that. So we're going to be looking at um, CCDs that are front illuminated and coated with lumogen. So that, that really brings our, um, I guess, the observed signal much down. And we're not so much worried about exposure, overexposure anymore, um, as much as just kind of medium exposures for strong flares. Um, but that, but actually working out the expected radiometry is absolutely an, an ongoing question so that we can make sure that we get really well exposed um, images. Yeah, and are you gonna be uh, looking at 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> a little bit of a cough there. Um, what what wavelengths? It's soft X ray and yeah. Like so I think it's a um, twelve point nine nanometer pass band in, for high C, and I think it's it's the same spectral regime for Kool Aid, uh, but obviously a, a wider uh, pass band into the spectral analysis there. Okay, so do you, do you happen to know if you're looking at um, any of the hydrogen, helium, lithium like ions? Um, that, I think they're, they're mostly iron lines, um, but I, yeah. I don't know for sure if there's other expected lines that okay. we're using. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Do you have any more questions? If not, then thank you again, Jen. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that. Um, okay.